Okay. And for you guys, because you just sent me. Excuse me. <laughs> okay. That's good. So she places a 150 gram rubber stopper on a rectangular sheet of glass, and then she slowly raises one end of the glass. So this is kind of like that video that I showed you of the guy. Um, well, I sent you the YouTube video of the guy, and he had the wooden block. Uh, it wasn't wooden, but he had a block on the wooden ramp, and he lifted the ramp, and as he lifted, the book ended up sliding or whatever was on the ramp. Remember if you watched it? So what that is is that the weight ends up being redistributed. As you start to lift that ramp, the weight now is not all directly in the y direction. So now some of that weight is driving it forward in the y direction. Does that make sense? So eventually, as you lift something, here, let me see if I can do an example. Okay, so we'll use this as my ramp. Let's say, Okay, so right now, obviously, it's stationary because the normal force is pushing up on it, it's pushing down on it, and friction is keeping it from moving, right? Because friction opposes motion. So right now, because it's not moving, it's static friction, right? To overcome static friction, you can do two things. I can add a force greater than that of static friction, or I can create an incline. Because as I create the incline, the weight of this is going to be distributed and some of it's going to go in the x direction pulling it forward and some of it's going to go in the y direction still keeping it on the box right so as i as i raise it the incline all that's happening is the weight is being redistributed therefore the static friction is overcome because some of the weight is putting the force in the x direction Right now, because there's no force in the x direction, it stays stationary. Because in order, in order for anything to move, force in the x direction has to be greater than the maximum static friction force. Right? This is a concept here. So right now, because it's stationary, the force in the x direction is less than the maximum static friction. Now, as I raise this and redistribute it, now it's going to move. So this is the, is the angle that's going to overcome static friction for this. So what I would say would be, that would be my experimental um, plastic on cardboard, okay? So I would, I would then use this angle to calculate the static friction to, to see what angle it would need for plastic on cardboard to overcome this static friction. And I could use this to be able to calculate, um, I would be able to use this to calculate my coefficient because my coefficient of friction, um, if I resolve for it, I'll have mu equals friction over the normal force. And I could calculate friction by using a spring scale. And I could calculate the normal force because I could calculate the weight of whatever the object was. So then I could use that to calculate for my coefficient. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, this is, a, this is the concept you have to understand in order to answer this. Okay, so that's why it says she slowly raises one end of the glass. Because now she's trying to find what angle it is that is going to overcome this friction, because she's trying to calculate experimentally this coefficient. She notes that the angle of the incline at the instant the rubber begins to slip is 54 degrees. What is the coefficient of static friction for rubber on glass? So our known values here, I make sure to write my notes on paper this time instead of um, visually because a lot of the ones time. <laughs> so my known values are mass equals 150 grams and that the angle is 54. Now it turns out we're not even going to have to use the mass in this case and here's why. So this is our incline. So let's write our little 
um, diagram. So this is the force of the wave. And you know that because it's on an incline, we're going to break this down into our components because our x-axis is the rim, which means that this is down at an angle. So we'll have our force of weight in the x direction and we'll have our force of weight in the y. Right? Everybody with me? Okay. Then you'll have your normal force, which is perpendicular to the surface, and then you'll have your friction holding it back. Now, what's important to know is that this friction is going to be static because she's just trying to figure out what the coefficient of the, the friction is, and she's trying to figure that out by what angle it moves. But all of that is kind of unimportant because what we know is the force of the weight in the x direction is going to pull it down the ramp. And the force of the weight in the x direction is going to be this component. The normal force, so the force of the weight of the x is going to equal friction at that point because it's just the exact moment that um, it begins to slip. Okay? So at that exact moment, you can say force of weight of the x is going to equal the maximum static friction. And then also the force of the weight in the y direction is going to equal the normal force. So with this knowledge of, the, of what's being opposite of each other, this is why we draw our diagram. Because we can visualize which forces are going to be directly opposite of each other. If they're directly opposite of each other, then we can calculate for them. Now, it might not look to you like it's opposite here, but it is. You can draw it like this. It's the same. Kind of like congruent triangle. All right. So if we know friction and we know normal force, then we can find mu. Because mu is equal to the force over the normal, friction over the normal force. Now, we can calculate weight because we have mass. But we actually don't need to in this case because friction is going to equal the force of the weight um, sine of the angle. And the normal force is going to be force of the weight cosine of the angle because one's the y component, one's the x component, right? So what's going to happen is you're going to equal force of the weight sine of the angle and you're going to have force of the weight cosine of the angle. If something is in the, if one value is the same in the numerator as the denominator and they're multiplied, what can you do to these two values because of algebra? What is anything divided by itself? One. One. So if I have force of weight divided by force of weight, this is technically one, right? Because it's anything divided by itself. So we can just cancel it, and we can say this is sine theta over cosine theta. Now, this is where it gets interesting. So this is the same as opposite over adjacent, because this is our angle here. X is opposite. Y is adjacent. So this is also the same as tangent of the angle, which gives us tangent of 54. And when you calculate that, you're going to get 1.38 for your answer. So listen, you don't have to know this step. Because if you were to do it on a test, you guys already know, you already knew this. You could have calculated weight. Take it, you could have done weight sine of the angle, weight cosine of the angle, and gotten the answer. This just simplifies it. So I'm showing you all the way down to 1.38. But if you plug in, so first you would have had to convert this to kilograms. So if you convert it to kilograms, you know there's 1,000 grams in one kilogram, and you would have had to do 1.50 kilograms. Then you would have calculated weight, and then you would have plugged weight in here. Then you would have done weight times sine of the angle, which you already know how to do. But if you know this step, you can just take the tangent of 54, you have less math steps. So you can do it this way. 
But if you don't want to remember it this way, just know that you do weight, sine of the angle, weight, cosine of the angle because of this. And you can calculate it the way you know how to calculate it. If you forget this step, it doesn't matter because you can just do it the way you know how to do it. Calculate for weight, take the sine of the angle, divide that by the weight, cosine of the angle, and you'll get the right answer either way. Does that make sense? So you, you also could have just done sine 54 divided by cosine 54. Yeah, That's exactly. Okay. And you, and you wouldn't have to know this. But if you know that this is the same as opposite over adjacent, you can just take the tangent of the number. It's just, like, it's just less calculations. The reason why in science math we want to do less calculations is because it eliminates that rounding error that you sometimes get by t doing more steps. Does that make sense? So that's why taking tangent of 54 is going to help us when we do that rounding error because sometimes you'll get like 0.15 and round it to 0.2 while somebody will get 0.14 and then they won't round it. Does that make sense? So if you didn't know about tangent, let's go over what you would do. If you didn't know about tangent and you didn't make that connection that it's opposite over adjacent, that's fine. Because here you would have to convert because mass is in kilograms always. Because remember, a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So we can't use a gram to get a newton. Does that make sense? It's a wrong unit. So we'd have to convert to 0 0.150. Then we would do 0 0.150 times 9.81, then sine of 54. Divide by, this is the weight, right? Because weight is mass times gravity. And I would do that divided by 0 0.150 times 9.81 cosine of 54. And hopefully, at this point, you would see that this is going to give you the same thing. So you can just do sine of 54 divided by cosine of 54. But if you multiply it out and multiply it out and divide it, it'll do the same thing. It's just more steps. So if you just do the algebra down to tangent, it's a little bit more simple. But either way, you're going to get the same answer because it's the same idea. Okay? So don't get overwhelmed being like, I don't understand the tangent thing. If you don't understand the tangent thing, do what you know is going to work. Rather than learn that extra step. But I'm showing you because some of you might just be like, oh, that's way easier to me. And some of you might be like, oh, that makes less sense and I'm not going to bother learning the tangent thing because I know how to do it this way. If you know how to do it this way, do it that way. Do what works for you to get the right answer. Don't try to be fancy if you understand another way. Whatever works best. Okay. Any questions on that one? Yes. Cosine over sine is cotangent. Sine over cosine is tangent. Tangent, but cosine yeah. over sine is cotangent. Well, let, let, me, let me show you why. Because I've been like mixing all of them up. Okay, let me show you. Fine. So, the reason we use so, sine, cosine, and tangent is because of algebra. Remember that when we did, when we found magnitude, we used the Pythagorean theorem, right? Because you have, this is C, this is A, this is B. A squared plus B squared equals what the hypotenuse is, right? Well, if we have triangles, we can use any kind of geometry or trigonometry math that we want to find values for a triangle. Because every force is going to be broken down into its components. So if this is the force of the wave, if this is the force of the wave, and we break it down into our y component and our x component, we have a triangle. Mm -hmm. So anything that we can know about a triangle, we can use to find this. If I gave you your components, you could solve what the weight is with that. And thus, you could solve what the mass is, because once you know the weight, you divide that by gravity, you get the mass. So for sine, cosine, and tangent, sine is opposite over adjacent. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Wait, this is hypotenuse. 
and then tangent is opposite over adjacent. So you can remember it as so ka toa. Yeah, that's been my favorite. Trying, she didn't even try. All right, so could tell. All right, so this just means if you put an equal sign here, it tells you what's divided by each other, basically. So sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, tangent is opposite over adjacent. Yeah. Okay, now if this is our weight, this is our incline and this is our angle, the x value is opposite the angle, so this is like opposite over the hypotenuse, which is sine. So anytime you're solving for x, you're going to use sine, because it's the opposite side. Oh yeah, if you're I, know, using, I, just, I was just wondering because, like, you know, there's other ones, so it's like sine, cosine, tangent, but then there's like the... Cosine. Oh, the inverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the inverse of that? these. So the inverse is going to help you. The inverse is going to help you find the angle if you know the sides. Yeah. So that's why we oh, use. Because yeah, that's, that's why we use tangent to negative one to find and that the angle. It's y over x, and yeah, it's cosine. Oh, okay, that makes all the sense. Yeah. So using this helps you find the side, the, the, the length of the side. Using the inverse helps you find the angle if you know the size. Yes. Okay. All right, next. And remember, if you don't understand tangent, do what you know. Do what's the easiest. But if you understand, if you could watch this video over and understand how to do the tangent, it knocks out just some time that you sit there punching numbers because you can just get all the way down and do the tangent. Just remember, the reason you can use tangent is because tangent is the opposite over the adjacent or x over y. So if x is sine of theta and y is cosine of theta, you can, it, you can make this tangent of the angle. That's all. Does anybody want to take a picture of this before I go? Okay. That's why you can do it. Now, if the weight was different, the other thing is just remember, if you have force of the weight on each end, then you're going to be able to just cancel it out because anything divided by itself is one. Can you use it only for 10? Or is it, or is it only 10? Is this for us? Um, what do you mean? Like, like if I, if, if okay. It, if it was like hypotenuse <laughs> over, or if, if it was like sine, would you sign that aspect? I, okay, I could do this. So say, so say they gave me the force of the weight and the y component. I guess I could do it. I could I could solve for something else. But remember that I'm not going to in physics because in physics, if I'm giving my given my components, I'm always going to have the x and y. So I'm always going to bring it down to tangent. So size would be tangent. Yeah. So don't confuse yourself. Just remember, this is just finding the x component. This is finding the y component. So if I'm trying to find my x and y component, it's always tangent because it's always going to be opposite over adjacent. Yeah. So don't worry. Just know that sine is used to find your x, cosine for your y, and tangent is always for your um, tangent is always for your if you're dividing your components, yes. it's tangent. Okay, listen, listen one more time. So, if on a test you forget if the x component or the y component is sine or cosine, draw yourself a triangle and figure it out. Can I do you say that? I, I <laughs> okay, that's fine. So if, if on a test. If on a test you're trying to figure out and remember which one's sine and which one's cosine, draw yourself a triangle. So I would draw it like this. Oops, that's a that's a rectangle. 
So I would draw it like this, and I would draw my angle and draw an arrow. If you draw an arrow down to the bottom one, that means it's sine, and this is going to be your x. So x is sine. If you draw it to the right, then that's going to be y equals cosine. So if you forget, that's how you would do it. Make sense? Okay. Yeah. Next one. Anyone want that video? Yeah, can you send it to me? Yeah. Send it okay, video. number six. A cute little 78 gram Mongolian gerbil is placed in a smooth plastic ramp and climbed at an angle of 40 degrees to the horizontal. The coefficient of static friction between the gerbil and the ramp is 0.82. Describe the change in motion, if any, that occurs after the animal is released. Assume that the gerbil does not actively contribute to the motion. So why do we have to assume that the gerbil is not actively contributing? Because it says. It because it says, but what, what, would, <laughs> what would it change? If the gerbil was actively contributing to the motion, what would it change? It would go faster. It would add a force. It would add a force, is what I was looking for. But you're right, it would go faster. It would have more acceleration. But remember that what we're trying to find, didn't it have an eraser? That's right. Okay. All right. So remember, it's asking, it's asking us, it says here, describe the change in motion, if any. So the first thing we're going to have to figure out is if there's any motion. If the gerbil were contributing to the motion, that would do, that would help overcome static friction. Because force has to be greater than the static friction in order for the gerbil to actually move, right? So let's go through our known values. Our known values, we have our gerbil that weighs, its mass is 78 grams. Um, it's the angle of the ramp that it's on, incline is 40. The static friction is 0 0.82, and your gravity, which is 9.81. So obviously, because it gave us the static friction, we know that we're probably going to calculate for the static friction first. Also, it asked us to describe its motion, if any. So in order for it to move, the force in the x direction must be greater than the, the mass. Yes. So let's give us our diagram. So it says that it is on a smooth plastic ramp, 40 degrees with the horizontal. So here we have our ramp, and here is our gerbil. All the forces on it. We have the normal force. We have the force of the weight of the gerbil. And we have the force of friction holding the gerbil in place, or not. It depends. If the gerbil overcomes static friction, then it will move. Wait, is that the gerbil on the top? No. This is the gerbil right here. The dot is the gerbil. What's that thing to the right? This is the <laughs> angle, friction. and this is friction. Oh. Yeah, I just, I smushed it into the arrow. That's what's confusing. Okay, so what what should have triggered you to think of something in our known values? Is there anything specific about our known values we would have to do anything with? Uh, circle, dot, the circle the line. Well, we're going to use that one, yes, but there's no way you could convert an angle. Is there anything we could convert? Meters per second squared. No, because gravity is always nine point one meters per second squared. Grams. Grams. What is it? What do we Kilo want? Mass to be kilograms. kilograms. We don't ever want to use anything in grams. So if you see grams, you should think divide by a thousand right away. So divide by a thousand, which gives us zero point zero seven eight kilograms. All right. So now we have our mass. Everything else is fine. So now we're going to calculate our static friction. We have our kinetic, our coefficient of static friction. What's the one thing we don't have right now? Normal force, the weight. No, no, you're the right. Normal the normal force, but our weight. But since so, our since our normal force, since we're on an incline, remember our normal force is going to be directly against the force of the weight only in the y. Yes. So we have to calculate our y component of the weight in order to get the normal force. So on. 
on a horizontal, normal force and weight are going to be directly opposite of each other. So normal force will equal the weight. Oh, so on an incline, it. it equals the Y component. So then whatever 0 0.078 times gravity is, that's the weight. And then you do that times gravity. cosine, cosine of the 40. 40. Right, exactly. So we'll do 0 0.078 times gravity. You really, you really got it. It clicked for you. I can tell. And then you do cosine of 40. Yeah, I just don't know all the like the F and so I have to learn all those curves. Yeah, so I posted the PowerPoint. Just go through the PowerPoint. It, there's a bulleted point, Josh. Um, I told them this the other day. So there's a bullet points on page 178. So it says, static friction can be this, is oriented this way, yada yada. Mm -hmm. And then page 177 has the same thing for kinetic friction. So if you memorize those bulleted points, you're gonna be a-okay. Oh. Remember, there's going to be, there's going to be concept questions on this test too. I think Ooh. there's about, I think there's about five math questions and about, 13 other. But if you've paid attention in class, if you've paid attention in class, studying the concepts for the math helps you study for the rest. So if you understand why it's this way, why it's that way, you're going to do well. So don't overstudy concepts, but I would go over the PowerPoint once or twice just to remember stuff. But I think since we've gone over so much math, you're going to read it and it's going to be like um, force has to be greater than this for that. And you're yeah. going to already know that. So don't stress about the concept questions. They're straightforward. Review them a little bit, but heavily on the math if you're confused on math. Okay, so we're going to calculate this. Um, I'm just going to... This is going to end up being 0 0.480 newtons. Okay. The thing is that we need to know if the force in the x direction is going to be greater than the friction. What is the force in the x direction that, that could be greater than friction? Because the gerbil's not moving. So what force could cause it to move? Weight in the... Not in the down, in the x direction. Because the weight in the down is keeping it on the incline. The weight in the x is pulling it forward. So we're going to have, so this is our friction, our maximum friction. Our force in the weight of the x direction is just going to be what? How would I find my weight in the x direction? Sine. Sine. So this, but we're going to do sine. Oh, the one thing that I didn't add in here is that you have to add, multiply by the coefficient of friction, too. I just didn't add it. Oh. Because this should be friction equals mu s times the normal. I just put the normal, and then, but make sure you don't forget to multiply it by mu. Times y. Um, Sine is s. I guess I just explained this. Okay, so this is our angle. This is our angle. Opposite is x. Adjacent is y. Right? So opposite over hypotenuse is sum. Yes. Yes. So then we're gonna calculate this value and you should get 0 0.491. So will our gerbil move? Will our gerbil move? Force of weight in x is 0 0.491 and FSX is 0.48. No. Oh, yes. It will move. It'll slide. Because force of the weight in the x is greater than static friction, the gerbil will move. So it says describe the motion. So you should say that it slides forward and it accelerates. So now, if if it gave me the coefficient of kinetic friction, I could also calculate what the acceleration was using F equals MA. 
And we've done that before. You don't have to do this in this problem, but I'm explaining it to you. So if it asked me for my acceleration as well, they probably would have given me a coefficient of kinetic friction. Then I would have calculated friction. Then I would have found my sum of forces in the X, which would have been weight plus kinetic friction, but technically it would be minus because it's opposite. So I opposite whatever kinetic friction was. Then I would use this force divided by the mass and I could calculate how much the gerbil accelerates as well. Right? And we've done that, but the concept, how you're going to practice this one is going to be your page 180. Page 180 problems. Make sense? Alrighty. Any questions? No. No. Okay. So if I would if I were to ask you if you could solve for acceleration, you should say no. There's not enough information. I would need the coefficient of kinetic friction. Because some people might think that they could calculate for it because they have the value of friction. But once it's moving, the friction changes. Do you have more or less friction when something starts moving? More, more. Less, actually. The coefficient oh, is going to be less. Because when you're, when you're not moving, all of your weight is going directly down, and your friction is keeping you, keeping you there. Once you start moving, you have overcome friction, which is your opposition of motion. And it's still there, but now you have a force pushing it forward. So now you have... Um, your coefficient will be smaller. So the coefficient of kinetic friction should always be smaller than that of static friction. Okay, I'm going to point some things out that I would study for tomorrow. I would study page 182 uh, on a roll. I would study example 8-9 on page 178 and example problem on 179. So basically all of the example problems in this chapter. But don't, I didn't put anything about example 8.12 or 8.13 on it because those problems are really long. What they want you to see is that you can do everything you've done all chapter and apply them a hundred different ways. Um, uh, it's pretty complicated. Yeah, it's it's pretty deep, but I I think you could all do it. But on a test, it would just be it would take you a good like twenty minutes to do it, and that would be your whole test at that point. So I'd rather I'd rather test you on each of the concepts individually. So I'm gonna test you on all the concepts in that one, but that one's really in depth. So I'd rather you focus on those. So don't bother with example eight twelve or eight thirteen. But study the um, questions 5 and 6 on page 180 and 182. Study, um, study what makes it rolling friction, what makes it static friction, what makes it kinetic friction, and all of that. And you'll, you'll be decent on this test. I imagine it will be a little easier than others because you guys seem to be catching on a little bit more this section. But if you don't practice the problems, you're going to get to the you're going to get to the test in blank, because it's just like if you if you practice a play in basketball over and, and you only do it one time, when you get into the game situation, even if you understood the play when your coach told you, once you get on the court, you're going to think, what was I supposed to do again? You have to repeat and repeat and repeat to learn something. So just practice it. But um, put in the work and you're going to see the benefit. I promise. If you have any questions, just literally rewatch the YouTube video.